Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Friday morning, just a few days before 2019 arrives, and um, we're glad that you're joining the show today. We appreciate it so very much. I want to make a quick announcement before we get started, um, and that is to remind you, everybody that's interested in World Bible School University online, uh, keep in mind that we are starting January the 7th. Uh, our instructors are set in place. Our uh, associate and bachelor's courses are set in place. Teachers are studying and preparing. And uh, good morning, Pastor Kyle and Dr. Fay. Uh, and so uh, remember that. The way you enroll, go to our website, BillHanshewMinistries.org. Find the link that says WBS University and fill out, download the application, uh, fill it out and get it back to us and the, the other uh, things are there. tells you all about it. Okay, so God bless you. Thank you so much. Good morning, Pastor Lynn. How you doing today, my brother? Good morning, Dr. Bill. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. I'm uh, raring for this, uh, this discussion this morning. Um, back um, a few weeks ago, Pastor Kyle Butler was on with me, and um, we, uh, I needed a couple of weeks to fill in the rest of the year while we're making plans for the new year. And Pastor Lynn was available and uh, he's been helping with, with his broadcast. We've been talking about understanding love. And I, I might say good morning, uh, David Jacobs and, and Kristen uh, and Bryant, uh, all of you. God bless you so much. Uh, I will say this, that as we've been discussing understanding love, uh, there is so much to this subject that uh, you know, in a couple of broadcasts, um, it never does us justice, uh, does the subject justice. So uh, down the road, we may have to come back together and talk some more. But the thing about love is, where do you draw the line? You know, uh, when we talk about God's love, most people think God's love is conditional. But you can't really prove that in, in scripture or any other medium because God's love is unconditional. God so loved the world. He loved the whole world that he gave his son. Now, I know it says to everyone who believes, but you have to understand that he was talking to the Jews at that time. And so, you know, I would have to say to those Jews who believe, but, you know, all of us came into this as believers for, uh, after Christ. He brought us in. We didn't choose to come in. We didn't say, okay, one day I believe now I'm a part of the, the, the Christian community. It didn't work that way. The Bible says it was the blood of Jesus that brought us in. Uh, so there was no more sacrifice of bulls and goats, no more uh, Levitical priesthood, no more uh, come to the temple and do all your traditional stuff. This is the thing of God loved the whole world. And he said, boom. Everybody in the future, come on in, you're brought in. Everybody in the past, present, and future were brought in by the blood of Jesus. And you know, Pastor Lynn, the Bible says in 1 John 4, verse 8, we've been talking about this. Uh, it says, he who does not love has not become acquainted with God, uh, does not and never did know him, for God is love. The thing I see is, and I'm going to turn you loose here in a moment, but the thing I see is, is that, that why people don't love one another. See, the God loving us is not an issue. It's our love toward each other. And, and that is what we've really been focusing on, what is so important. Uh, it's a matter of why I don't love my fellow man is because I've not really become acquainted with God's love and how he feels about humankind. So take us from there and just, just open your heart and share with us today everything that you want to share. Well, Dr. Bill, I was just in the barber shop before I hustled back to get on the broadcast. And that was one of the conversations that we were talking about while in the barber shop, you know, uh, God's unconditional love and how, yeah. you know, what we have uh, perceived because of what primarily we've heard in church, we have yeah. placed conditions on his love and we have made it seem like God loves us like we, you know, we love each other, which, yeah. you know, we're honest. We um we love each other conditionally, and yeah. hopefully as we mature and grow in our understanding of God and and, and uh, understand that we are one with Him, we start to live like Him, but we also start to love like Him. And once we start to to uh, you know get that understanding, I I just you know I say that we take more conditions off of our love. 
You know, we, oh, yeah. we start to love one another more unconditionally because we become more like him. But, yeah. you know, one, one thing that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really starting to understand is we love one another according to our understanding, as you said, of God's love for us. Uh-huh. And that's why it's so important for us to hear the gospel, because the gospel, you know, declares to us how much God loves us. And the more as the great commandment, you know, the more we love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind and our strength, and the more we love our neighbor as ourselves. And what that's telling us, you know, purely is that we have to be able to love ourselves. And I believe that the reason there's not more love is because, you know, we're not preaching and teaching a message that 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 declares that we should love ourselves. Because I, you know, I believe the more we love ourselves, understand his love. It is no other way. The more that we are going to love each other. And so that is what the gospel is intended to help us love uh, each other, but also help us to love ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when we think about um, ISIS, when we think about the racial conflicts that we've seen in our country uh, in our lifetime, when we think about lower class versus higher class income families, we think about those who look down on their nose uh, toward others, especially in the church where we look down on those who do not attend church, maybe even people who love God but got burnt in a, in a church setting and they don't no longer attend church. So now the regular churchgoers, the deacon board, the pastor, whoever, look down on them. We have all of these kinds of conflicts. We, we now today, we have the conflict of identity. Uh, I was born a man, but I'd really rather be a woman or vice versa. Or uh, one, one man told me, he said, I was a pastor. Uh, I was a, 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 a seminary grad. I was married, uh, uh, but I got I got a divorce, got burnt out, and I left all of that, went into a homosexual relationship. We have all of these conflicts. And so, you know, I was in a, uh, well, let, let me just say it this way, that when we look at all of this stuff, all of the conflicts going on in society, none of them have to do with the truth of what God has done in Christ for mankind. But mankind has, as we said last week, We've created God in our own image by thinking God hates me, so I'm going to hate everybody else. Uh, I feel miserable because I've done some sin, and the way I was raised is if you do that, you're going to burn in hell forever. So now I'm miserable knowing I'm going to burn in hell forever. But even so, even so, what about our relationship with each other? Because if, if I don't, and you said it very well, if I don't love myself and how I love myself has to be based on my, my understanding of how God loves myself, how God loves me. So if I don't believe God loves me, still, if I come to that place, and I don't want to make this confusing, but if I come to that place to totally be convinced that God loves me, yet I still have horrible feelings toward people, then I, I really haven't understood that God loves me. Let's say it this way, Pastor. Uh, 1 John 4, verse 18 in the Living Bible says, we need have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us eliminates all dread of what he might do to us. If we are afraid, it is for fear of what he might do to us and shows that we are not fully convinced that he really loves us. So we're not talking about a human emotion uh, an emotional love uh, that has perfected us. But we're talking about that God is perfect and the perfect one lives in us. And that's really the issue. If I can understand that God is perfect and the perfect one lives in me, perfecting me, so there's a manifestation of his perfect love flowing out of me, doesn't that really have a, a tendency to change the way I view other people, regardless of their the status that we just mentioned? Absolutely. You know, change starts inside out. And that, yeah. is, that is the thing that we need to, to understand where a church tries to change, change who we are outside before yeah. it, a change on the inside. We need to understand real change uh, works inside out. And the yeah. more... I think I heard you say if Dr. K is, is on 
um, on the broadcast or she listens to it later, one thing that has stood out, one thing that she says is that what we do is we project what's in us out of us. Uh-huh. And that's the thing. We need to be able to understand that we already have all the things, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, kind. We have all the God, God's goodness within us. We're one with him. But the thing that we need to do is be able to project what's in us out of us. But yeah. that comes through, through being on a place. Matter of fact, we got to be honest. There's a lot of people that simply don't want to love. And that is the real issue that we need to address. Some people yeah. don't want to, to love their neighbor because their le- neighbor might not look like them or might not agree with them. But that's yeah. the thing. All of us have to come to a place that we want to love because it's there. It's available to us. It's not something that has to be conjured up. It's already there. We're right. one with him, as you said. Love is already there. But the, we have to have the desire to love one another. And once we have that desire to love on one another, it, it naturally flows. But, you know, I, I, I believe, Dr. Bill, one of the issues is that, you know, you were talking about the, the scripture, you know, perfect love casts out all fear. Right, one right. of the things that I, I believe that we struggle is because, you know, traditional church operates opposite of according to, to what the truth says, because traditional church operates on fear instead uh-huh. of love. And, and, and what we have tried to do for generations is try to fill people into a relationship with God instead of giving them a message that will bring them to a relationship with God based on love. And so that's why I believe that I struggled for so many years is because, you know, I was operating according to fear within me instead of love within me. But now that I've come to the revelation of the truth that God really is love and I'm loving myself, it's much more, it's much easier for me to be able to love others despite where they are in life, despite what they look like, despite anything else, because the love within me is naturally flowing out of me. Right, exactly, exactly. Now, you know, when you talk about fear, Uh, Because fear really does hinder love relationships, but fear also hinders my view of how God feels about me and how he feels about other people. So when we talk about love uh, uh, and and fear in that that thing, think about this. Uh, Many years ago, and I'm not trying to promote a ministry, but many years ago uh, when AIDS uh, was really becoming out of the closet, so to speak, people that were AIDS victims. And uh, there was such a fear of don't use the same bathroom as an AIDS victim. Uh, don't use the, don't don't uh, share a meal with an AIDS victim. I remember uh, again not to promote a ministry, but I remember Kenneth Copeland uh, on his television broadcast. This, this has probably been 25 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. They had a a, a prayer uh, line, for lack of a better way to say it, and. Uh, all kinds of AIDS, pe- people that had AIDS came forward. And I want to tell you how Kenneth Copeland ministered to them. Uh, again, I'm not pushing a, a, a camp or a, a ministry um, a venue like Word of Faith or anything. But, but the way he ministered to them is he reached his arms around them and he just poured love into them. Uh, I thought after all of the fear thing about, um, uh, you know, don't, don't uh, don't shake hands with them or people that have open wounds, all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, here's a guy that says, you know what? I'm not afraid to approach that because after all, fear should not be a part of our vocabulary, not a part of our thinking, not a part of our, our mannerisms. Um, and so we literally can express love. I mean, pastors like this, think about, we live in a multi-dimension, we're a multi-dimensional being. We're not just in this earth realm, although because of what we see and what we touch and understand seems to influence that, but we're also a part of the realms of God. So how do I live in the supernatural realm? I do it by faith, all right? So how do I uh, just love somebody that's making it super difficult for me to love them, whether they're just a a belligerent, mean person or whatever. I have to do it by faith. I do what I believe Jesus would do, and I do it shunning all fear and absolutely operating in faith and saying, you know what? I'm going to love this person. I'm going to be kind to this person. Uh, No matter how long it takes, I'm going to reach them, but I'm not going to reach them by telling them, 
turn or burn, uh, serve Jesus or you're going to go to hell. Uh, I do it by saying, you know what? I love you. Uh, so how we convey this gospel message is so super important. Yes, it is. And see, one thing I like what you said, you know, and I'm going to talk about this this week, about us really being multidimensional beings. You uh-huh, know, there's uh-huh. this realm that we live in, this this physical realm, but then there's also a spiritual realm. That's it. What I believe is more real to God because God is spirit, the spirit realm in which all of us, he intends. And I believe the message of Jesus was to, to, to show us how to function in that spirit realm. Yes. But see, when we start to function in that, all of the issues that we've had, the, all of the fears that we have, uh, I believe that, you know, you, you were talking about uh, with age, but I believe fear is the root of most of the division, if not all of the division that, that we see in the world today, you know, sure. um, Blacks fear whites, whites fear blacks. And, you know, all, all of the division that we see today has some root in some type of fear. Yes. But, you know, what what starts to happen when we start to, to shed the flesh or the carnal mindset is we start to live according to that that dimension, that 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 spirit realm. But what that does is it takes away all of the things that has caused fear, like, you know, Color of skin, you know. Paul yeah, said, yeah. "There's neither there's neither Jew nor Greek, uh, you know, male nor female, slave nor free, for all are one in Christ." That is a spiritual realm dynamic that we are supposed to live by, you know. And and so that is the one thing that helps us to love one another. When we take away all of the things that have kept us separate, that was never intended to be a part of our understanding of one another, yeah. because we are first and foremost we are spirit beings. And so once we start to understand that and start to operate according to that, all fear is gone. There's no need for me to fear anybody because in, in God's eyes and, 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 and should be everybody else's eyes that I am one with him and I'm one with everybody else. And so yeah. we need to take away that, that, that fear and, and all of these things that are keeping us from loving one another genuinely. Yes. Now, now back to this thing about, uh, God's perfect love. Remember, there is a scripture quoted from the King James Bible that says, um, uh, be ye therefore perfect, even as something like even as the Lord your God is perfect. Okay, we know that word actually translates mature. But think about this. Uh, Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by one offering, now we're talking about the cross, he has perfected forever. Think about that. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I like to say it this way, that we have become perfect even as Christ is perfect before the Father. And the being sanctified part is that the understanding I'm still coming into. So I may not understand. You know, it's like the Bible said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. We are equal with God in the sense that we were created in the exact mirrored reflection of our God. So the fullness of God, the the completion of everything God is, lives on the inside of us. But why we don't act like God, think like God, and talk like God is because we're still shy of an understanding of how God thinks. Is the, my, is the mind of Christ in us? Absolutely. We have the fully manifested mind of Christ. However, in spite of that truth, I still don't have an understanding of everything that's in his mind. And because of that, we have a tendency to not act like he acts or think and talk like he talks, but it's still there. So I would just say this, never give up on the way uh, of how a person reacts toward others because it's the Father's love that's perfected us forever at the cross, even while his love is becoming clearer to us in our understanding. So I really, I just really feel like that's an important emphasis today that don't give up where you're at. Everybody listening today, we've got a ton of people watching, but don't give up where you're at because where you're at right now uh, may not be the same and chances are won't be the same tomorrow. For me, Pastor Lynn, the way I believe today probably wasn't the way I believed last week. I mean, We spend so much time in the word. We're an ever evolving people in our understanding. And as I said on the show last night, um, 
we had a lot of technical difficulty last night. But but as I said on the show last night, we have constant downloads of information from the Holy Spirit. That's called revelation. And so he's constantly upgrading our belief system by saying, you know, I love you. And you're saying, but, you know, Lord, I messed up. He said, I love you. And you're saying, but, Lord, I can't stand that person over there. And he says, I love you. That's, that's his focus. That's all there is to it. And uh, I, I just really believe that as we understand how perfect he has made us in him, even while our understanding is lacking, it just continues to mature us. So we start thinking just like our father thinks. Amen. And you know, Dr. Bill, I believe that love is the greatest power there is. Come on. And 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 love is is I mean, I mean love is God. And so that means that everything that we see, everything, me sitting on this chair, there's love in this chair because God is in everything. He is the creator of all things. And so I just believe that that is why it's so important for us to, to preach a message of love because yeah. it's only God's love that can actually change us. It's his love that changes us inside out, not behavior modification that we have heard all of these years in, yeah. in, in church. It is his love that 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 does it. You know, I was listening to, you know, and uh, again, I was in the barbershop before I got here and, uh, you know, the guys were talking and, and one of the uh, brothers was, you know, he said, man, you know, he, he lives a, a great distance, but he's come to visit the ministry. Uh, a few times, and he said, man, once I am ready to settle down, I'm coming to your church, because he said, I heard in your church, you were preaching and um, talking about love, and that made sense to me, and it yeah. just made me think, that is the message that he's supposed to hear in the church that he goes to, that is the foundation of everything that God yeah. stands for, is love, and so I just believe ultimately you know, we, we think that we have to fear people into a relationship with God, fear people right. into to acting right. But I told them it really is uh, uh, understanding love that changes a, a person inside out. You know, and I, and I used the example. I told, you know, it, it, they were in the barbershop listening to me, and I said, I used this example. I said, there are things that I could do that goes contrary to I know what, what God's will is in my relationship with my wife. That is a marital covenant. When I married my wife, I, I came into a marital yeah. covenant with her. And I said, you know, I don't do not do some of the things that I could do, not because I'm scared of the consequences or scared of what might happen. I don't do those things because I love her. And it's that love that keeps me from doing those things, not fear. And, and I believe that that is the thing that all of us need to start hearing more of every Sunday, not just Sunday in church, but every day we need to hear messages of God's love because if, if anybody is going to live right, as, as we say, yeah, it's, it's yeah. according to understanding God's love because that love saturates our heart, it changes our mind, and it helps us without even any effort or, or intention. It helps us to live the life that we know that God wants us to live. Now, Pastor, you brought up a really huge point, and and that is concerning you and your wife, which we could we could transition transit into uh, us and God. Is you there's things you don't do because you love her. It's not a motivation of fear, but it's a motivation of love. I I posted last night just a little statement out of my uh, notes in my broadcast. I said, grace has never been a matter of having a choice to disagree with God. So in, in other words, for me, what I'm saying by that is that I, uh, I obey, you know, Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands. There are things that he says, do this. It's not a thou shalt do like the old covenant, but even in the new covenant from Acts to the book of Revelation, there are things that we're instructed to do. So we do them not because we're afraid of God, because remember what uh, I read earlier in 1 John 4, 18, uh, our motivation cannot be fear. Our motivation must be love. So love, to, uh, one translation says there's no dread in love. Uh, it, it, and this translation I read says his perfect love for us eliminates all dread. I'm not afraid of what God might do to him 
to me anymore. Uh, re remember the old Pentecostal preaching or, or whatever denomination our backgrounds are when they used to preach because of Saul. And he said, my spirit will not always strive with man. So they bring that into the modern time and said, you know what? You mess up. You better watch out. God's not spirit's not always going to strive with man. And we get this sense of abandonment. God's going to abandon us if we don't do things a certain way. That's false doctrine. It's always been false doctrine. Uh, it's impossible for, I mean, let's, let's say it this way. Humanity did not learn everything they do from God. In other words, fathers who abandon their children. Okay, that didn't come from God. But yet society has said, this is my concept of God. If I mess up, God's going to abandon me. Forgetting that he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father God will never abandon not one of his creation. That's why he doesn't punish people. That's why he doesn't uh, ha has no plan to send people to a place of eternal torment. Uh, people don't even understand the comment, com, uh, the, the, the definitions of hell or Gehenna or Sheol or all of those things. They have specific meanings that were pertinent in the first century. They have nothing to do with us today. Father God does not do that, period. But yet this false concept that man has came from a religious uh, misconception uh, and that has produced fear of what God might do to them. And that's be when, when we can know that people lack an understanding of the Father's love. You know what? Last week, I, I read a, a quote that really, really blessed me. Mm -hmm. And I've known it all the time, but I guess it put it into the right wording for me. But it says, in our relationship with God, we are never punished for our sins but we are punished by our sins. And you know what that really ministered to me? Because what that is saying is God doesn't punish us. He doesn't intentionally punish us for anything that we do or what we don't do. But the reality is when we suffer consequences, it is because of our own doing. It's what we've done. There Think are going to be consequences to sin here. And, and see what we have long believed is that we have to scare people straight. <laughs> as as the, the, there used to be a show out there, scare scare straight. straight that yeah. They would take kids to a prison and and uh you know scare them scare them to death to try to get them to live right. But but see, the truth is is that yes, things will happen. But because of what we've heard in church of all of these penalties and all of these consequences that God right. will do, all of these evil things that He will do to us when we mess up. Uh, you know, we don't understand that the things that happen to us is because of our own doing. That's In this it. world, we are going to have things that happen, but most of it is because we've done something we know we're not supposed to do, and then we 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 have to suffer for it. But see, right. because of what we have heard so much, when those things happen, we get mad at God, like He did it. That wasn't God. But the danger in that is is that when these things happen, when we make a mistake, God wants to be the one that pulls us out of those, those hurts and those pains, those situations. But if you think that he initiated, you know, if you, know, if you think that he is the author of your pain and your suffering, then you will never have the faith to believe him or trust him to bring you out. And so yeah. that's why we yeah. must have this message of love, that he does love us. He wants only what's best for us. He, he only wants what's good for us. And yeah. I believe that that is what the message of Jesus Christ is, is, is supposed to show us, that he only wants what's good. He is a good, good father, as the song says. He wants what's best. It is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Them. All of the all of the, the scriptures that declare how good he really is, and so we got to understand that that is all uh, founded on the fact that he loves each and every one of us. Amen, 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 amen. Uh, we're getting a lot of hits uh, today on on this thing about consequences. Now I know this is a really far fetched example, but let's say that I take a a. a pretty good size hammer, um, um, a, a 24 ounce, a 30 ounce hammer, and I lay my finger down and I just whack it real good. Uh, I could say I was bad. That was God punishing me. 
But that's probably the most vivid example of I did it to myself. Well, my decisions are my decisions. You know, I have a real problem with this phrase, God is in control. And I'll tell you why I have a problem with it. It's not that ultimately the structure of the universe and uh, life going on and seeing the future isn't a God is in control concept, but it's my day-to-day -day decisions. If I choose to walk out in the road and get my leg hit by the corner of a car passing by, God didn't do that. That was not God being in control. Uh, maybe God kept me from being so stupid that I just got in front of the car and got run over and was killed. I don't know. But it was my choice. If I choose to cheat on my wife uh, with another woman, uh, number one, uh, my, my wife may kill me, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but that's my choice. It's, it's not a God did it. And so when we think about that, you know, think about this. I have seen people who were sentenced to prison, to death row, to a life imprisonment or death row that actually were set free. I think that there have been times that God worked in the system that somehow for some purpose, maybe another Billy Graham, maybe another T.L. Osborne, I don't know. But for all practical intents and purposes, if you want to take a gun and blow somebody away, chances are once you get caught, you're going to do life in prison uh, for voluntary manslaughter. That's called consequences. It's a consequence to your action. If you go down to the to the corner convenience store and you rob them at gunpoint or by any means, uh, the truth is you're going to get caught. You're going to go to jail and you're going to either be paying fines or do 60 days in jail or whatever the case may be. It's called consequences. You know, Pastor, uh, when we see ministers who abuse their ministry position and, and do their congregations wrong, there's consequences attached to that. So no matter all of these examples, there are consequences and it's us that brings them on ourselves. But the way I get around that as I'm listening to you today is that if I understand that God loves me, I mean, there's nothing I can do or no place I can go that will escape the father's love. I don't want to, you know, David's once said, you know, if I go into to hell, uh, I'll, I'll find him there. Now, David was not talking about a physical, literal, eternal place of suffering, although in David's mind, that might have been the case. The, the, the thing is this, no matter what, you can't escape God's love. Now, in life, can we feel abandoned? Can we feel not loved? Sure, they're human emotions, but, you know, let's grow up. It's, it's a false concept. It, it's a, a false image uh, of, of the, 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 the re residual thoughts in us left over from all the religious teaching we've heard in our lives. Um, it's just not a true concept of God. You know, you came up under pastors. I came up under pastors. Uh, I talked with Pastor Kyle. He's come up under pastors. We had some great mentors in our life, but we also had people who did not have a proper understanding of the Father's love. They didn't have even have a good layout of a biblical concept and what it meant in the century it was written in and how it related to people. So it, it's it's the, the thing is, is that religion has what religion has preached has made love unclear to many people. So now here you and I in the, uh, the 21st century, we're preaching love. You have a church. You do live broadcasts with Pastor Kyle. I do live broadcasts all week. We're trying to tell people, look, it don't matter what somebody told you in the past. Here's the reality of it is God loves you and you can't prove in scripture any other way than God loves you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're, you're absolutely right. That is a very dangerous statement when somebody says God is in control, because what that says is that everything that happens is God's will. But we know that's not true. Of course. Not. If he was truly in, in control, um, that, that means that everything that, that, that happens, absolutely everything is under his power. But we know that's not true. And that is a very dangerous statement. You know, and, and, and we make that statement. It's easy for us to make that statement when things are going right for us. But yeah. when things start going wrong, 
you know, there has to be a, a, I call it a theological dilemma when we say God is in control and all these bad things are happening. But I just believe that what really we need to understand and what we need to teach and what I'm going to, you know, I, I said I'm going to start teaching this all this year, but I yeah. think I'm going to teach it the, all, the rest of my life, <laughs> is the mindset. That is the thing that needs to change. It's the mind. You can go to church. You can be a member of church for 30, 45 years and not never change your mind. You can change what you do. You can change what you give. You can change what you dress. But what I believe that the gospel is intended to do is change our mind, how we think, because there is power in our minds. As a man thinketh, so is he. And that yeah, is the thing yeah. that the gospel is supposed to do, change how we look at God, view God, that he is love. And once that starts to happen, everything else starts to change. But we get caught up in a lot of the things that we've heard, and we never change our mind, and we're stuck in what I call a stronghold, not, not even desiring to change how we think. And we live miserable lives all of our lives yeah. because we're not changing our mind. Mind, once we change our mind, it changes everything. It changes our life. It changes it. But but that is the thing. We cannot get caught up in, in that fact. And, and, and see, God gives us free will. He gives us the ability to choose the way we think. And that is the thing. But, you know, it is it's so clear to me now, if we don't choose to change how we think, you know, yes. we will never change our lives. We will never change how fruitful our lives are. We will never change how we love God. We will never change how we love each other. It all starts with the change of a mindset. But understanding, too, that he has given us that ability to change. He's given us that choice. We can stay the way we've always been, and we always uh, will live like we always live. Yeah. But if we know that there's a better life, that there's a more abundant life out of there, it starts with, with changing of the mindset. You know, uh, uh, as ministers who have performed many wedding ceremonies, uh, I think about this. You have a couple, you counsel them, do premarital counseling, you prepare them for life, for marriage, uh, you do the wedding ceremony, but there's still another step, and that's called the consummation of the marriage. Consummation is that night when a man and a woman enter into a sexual encounter and they consummate their love, they consummate their marriage. First uh, John chapter four talks about many things. He talks about uh, some of the uh, the printer's headings, like seeing God through love, and explains what that is. But then he talks about the consummation of love, and the very first scripture concerning this consummation of of love has been perfected among us in this way that we have boldness in the day of judgment. Now, of course, the day of judgment, you know, the Bible says it's appointed unto men once and I after that, the judgment, we died in Christ, we were judged in Christ, so that has taken place. He says, and here's why. He says, because as he is, so are we in this world. So as he is, now I can look at my life and say, wow, I'm a minister of, of, of this next summer, uh, about June, 47 years. I've been, I started preaching at 17 years old and man, I don't even get this. I don't, I don't, I don't see myself as he is. So am I in this world. I have so many shortcomings and I, I fall short and, and I start judging myself in all of these different ways based on all of my shortcomings. But when God speaks and he speaks to a writer, it's just like when you preach a message, you're speaking for God. And in essence, God is saying something to you. He gave you a revelation of something. Now you're conveying it to a congregation. And so you're not saying, here's my shortcomings, but here's what God is saying to you. And you deliver that word to the congregation. This is God speaking through a writer, through John. And he's saying, as he is, so are we in this world. So God is saying to us that, we are his best representation in this world. Now, in my flesh, in my natural, unrenewed thinking, I may not think like God, but let's face it. We didn't start in this yesterday, and God has been mentoring us and, and tutoring us and bringing us into an understanding that, that in our soul, part of us, and probably a great portion of our soul, is renewed to the mind of Christ. It understands truth. So I can look back. It's just like the, the Bible says that uh, uh, he who sins is of the devil. 
for this purpose, for the devil to send from the beginning, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, and they might destroy, the word destroy there means to undo or unemploy all the works the devil had done. Now, the devil was the law in that day, but think about this. He who sins is of the devil. So you have to ask this question. Wow, I lied. Who sinned? My unrenewed mind or my renewed mind? It wasn't all of me that sinned. It wasn't all of me that did something wrong that might um, tell the world that uh, of this poor representation of God. It was that unrenewed part of me. So the fact is, as he is, so am I in this world. Not because I walk in, in perfection in all my thinking, but it's because he has perfected me while I'm still getting the rest of my act in line with his thinking. And you're right, Pastor, the mind, the unrenewed mind, that the things that we need to change our heart attitude towards are still, uh, we're still working on those stuff as he works in us. But let's face it, we didn't, 20 or 30 years ago, we weren't preaching this message of unconditional love. We were preaching a very conditional God who loves based on performance. Third, some people 30 years ago, some people 40 years ago, preaching this perverted message. And, you know, if ever there was, you know, the word Antichrist doesn't appear in the book of Revelation. Beast there does not mean Antichrist. Antichrist what referred to a man that, I think it was John, who saw come out of a, pap, a public bathhouse. He had a, per, a name, I don't re recall at the moment, but he was referred to as Antichrist. Now, the spirit of Antichrist is actually what the Bible nails. Okay, so what is the spirit of Antichrist? Anything that is anti the message of Christ. Right. All right, so who is Christ? The anointed one, the person of love, the person of grace. Anything that is anti the person of grace or the way that grace thinks, the way that love thinks. So does God love humanity? Oh, my goodness. Father God loves the worst of humanity just equally like he loves the best of humanity, if, if we can classify it that way. <laughs> yes. You know, Dr. Bill, um, one, one thing that, that I am really doing, and I'm at a place now in ministry that when I preach and I teach, I used to, well, you know, we probably all did this. We were preaching to get people saved and get them to the altar. And we would Come on. use all kinds of messages and, you know, we would use fear. And, uh, and then, you know, ultimately, I'm at a place in my life now, I am convinced changing my mindset will, will change my life. I believe that my life right now is a product of what I have uh, stored into my, you know, the mind is broken down into, you know, the conscious mind, what I'm thinking right now, but there's also the subconscious mind. Come you on. know, some people want to break it down a third time, the super conscious mind, but I believe that my life right now, my beliefs, my thoughts, my feelings, actions, everything is based on uh, what's, what I have allowed to, to be into my, you know, enter into my subconscious mind. And now that I'm starting to understand, you know, the truth of God and, 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 and his word, I'm starting to understand that there's things probably going on in the back of my mind, my subconscious mind, mm -hmm. that are prohibiting me from living the abundant life. And so I believe ultimately my goal now is to help to change my mind. And if I preach and teach and it helps to change other people mind, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's on them as well. But I'm understanding there's a lot of things that I've held on to and in my thinking that that has really hindered me in, in my walk with God. I believe that he wants us to live a, a prosperous life, an abundant life, a good Absolutely. life. But I also believe that we need to hear the right message. Now, what I, I guess you and I have been talking about today, there's no greater message than the, that, that to change how we think than understanding God's love. That changes everything. And so the more and more now I'm listening, I won't, I won't dare listen to a message that talks about condemnation and guilt, a message that, that makes me feel bad about myself because I know that's contrary to the truth. Sure. That's contrary to God's word. I only want to hear messages that talks about the good news, the gospel, which is the greatest news is that he loves me just like I am. Yes, yes, amen, amen. And you know, Pastor, I find that also that, uh, you know, we, 
for, forget television for the moment, but just think about YouTube and Facebook and other social medias. There's a lot, a lot of, 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 and I'll just call them because they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a lot of preachers and teachers that are sharing messages, but I find myself only able to listen to a, a, a few seconds to a minute of what I'm hearing if it doesn't line up to the message of, 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 of God's grace. Now, uh, you know, one of the things we've done uh, when we decided to, uh, years ago, my wife and I had an in-church, uh, an in-house uh, university, and uh, we, we were with a, a, a certain faith camp. Uh, but uh, over the years, we've, we've been teaching online with an, an international university. They're not really our cup of tea in turn, and I, I mean no, nothing disgraceful toward this other university. Uh, they don't really, we don't really have the same message. But when I teach my classes, my classes are always based on the finished work of Jesus and always based on the nature of a loving Heavenly Father. That's the two criteria. I teach hermeneutics. That's the two points of criteria I use to interpret Scripture, and that's what I teach all my students. Now, come January 7th, we're opening our university that is an a, an affiliation of this other university because they're worldwide and we're, we're just getting started. Uh, but one of the things we said was, is that you will earn an education as teachers instruct you from the biblical platform of the gospel of grace and truth, which I believe to be the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. You know, the, the thing is, I've come to a place in my life that I cannot dance around the truth. I don't want to hurt people's feelings, but let's let's be honest. I don't want to lie to them either. Right. I, I don't want to tell them, you know, hey, this is the popular view. So, hey, go with that uh, because it's not God's view. I can't say let's just take a scripture and interpret it any old way and whatever. Let's just throw it up in the air. And if it falls to the right, we'll teach it that way. If it falls to the left, we'll teach it. I can't do that anymore. When revelation comes to you. You cannot escape it. You can turn every which way you go, but you can't escape the truth that has hit you face to face, that you, that's come to your understanding. So this thing about teaching grace and truth, this thing about teaching that Jesus is the person of unconditional love. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the, the famous love chapter that love does not behave itself rudely. Uh, right. It doesn't seek its own. It's not easily provoked. It, it thinks no evil. Man, I think of just that first verse, and I think, man, sometimes I'm easily provoked, and I think that sometimes I have some evil thoughts, and I think, Lord, I don't believe in hell anymore, but uh, except the personal hell people go through, but boy, there's some sure some folks I'd like to see fry. You know, you have these, you have these thoughts. Uh, have I ever been rude? Oh my goodness, sure I have. It, but love doesn't behave itself rudely. So we have to come to the revelation that that's not talking about my love. That's talking about the Father's love. That's how God is and 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 the way he thinks. And, uh, you know, I may fall short of that, but here's the reality of love. No matter how short I fall, it never changes the truth of God's love. So I can't teach it based. On, and that's why we've had to learn, Pastor, uh, as we're we're preparing to to school ministers uh, to become graduates uh, uh, in time with doctorate degrees uh, that they can't teach based on the human experience. Right. You, your ministry cannot and your message cannot be based on, well, I had this experience. And so that told me that God is this way. Scratch that. What is the truth? Teach based on truth because it's not the human experience that will set people free. Jesus said, you'll know truth and truth will make you free. So for that to happen, you and I have to first experience truth and become free in areas so we can say, you know what? I know that firsthand. Now here, let, let, me, let me give you some personal insight on that. I think that's so awesome. It has to be that way. It, it is. And that same scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, I believe the first uh, couple of scriptures, you yeah. know, it's talking about it doesn't matter what's coming out your mouth, how you sound, how loud you are. I'm not, You know, it, it doesn't matter what you do, which we have, have traditionally taught in church, all of the, the good works. It, that, none of that matters. It says that if you do those things and have, have not love, then you are nothing. And so I, I, <laughs> I just believe that the best thing that we can learn how to do, if we really want to impact this world and change people's lives, 
It's not about how good I can preach. It's not about how good I can pray. It's not about the amount of degrees I have. It's all about loving people. So we really want to change this world. I just believe it's simply in, in understanding God's love for us and letting that change us inside out and then simply love uh, other people. Because you know what? People that are hurting, they don't want to, they, they don't need to hear a scripture. They need mm -hmm. somebody to show them love. And that love, I believe, is the greatest gift that we can give to anybody, especially those that are in a time of need. Yeah. Uh, my, my wife just uh, uh, commented and said, uh, God is constantly perfecting us in his life. Uh, I think that was probably his love. Yeah, his love. Uh, this is called maturity and perfection. When we are open to receive his love corrections and, you know, love corrections, when we think about there, there's a lot of words today that are anti correction. But, you know, some of the things you and I preach uh are really correction. We're correcting people's mindsets. Uh, we're not trying to beat people. So there is a difference. But God, I've had God tell me, you know, don't uh, uh, like things I believe, for example, I was sharing last night, many years, and my Bible is stuffed full of these pieces of paper of different chronological charts. Many years, I looked at the chronological charts of how the Bible was spread out uh, year by year, chapter by chapter. And one day, Holy Spirit took, I saw a vision and he took all of that and stacked it on top of each other. And I saw a brand new biblical perspective. I saw that from the cross to AD 70 wasn't really all that far apart. I saw the cross in the book of Revelation. I saw so many things. To me, that was a course correction of my theology. It changed everything for me. So uh, love, uh, you know, my, my, my wife's mother, she always had a paddle hanging on her wall and the paddle was oh, it just, it was a wooden spoon, but it had this cushion crocheted thing all over. If you got a whipping with that, you'd never know it. But the point is, is God's love. I've had God correct me and I felt so much love in that correction that I actually didn't feel corrected. See, God doesn't think like we think, but the truth is we're supposed to start thinking like God thinks. And so how we relate to people, how we interact with people are all extremely important. But I think you're right. Uh, when we first uh, uh, you, you first committed to help me finish out the year, um, we talked about uh, knowing God's love through understanding our love toward each other. And, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this last week. I preach so many things and there's so many things that are, are, are worth repeating that I don't know which show I say them on. But uh, but the last command Jesus gave us was at Passover, just before just a few days, maybe even a few hours before he went to the cross, because from Passover to Pentecost was for, uh, 50 days. But at Passover, he said, I give you one commandment. He didn't say this is the last commandment. He didn't say this commandment supersedes all other commandments, but he just said, I give you one commandment. And this one commandment seemed to be a superseding commandment. I think it's John 17. And he said that you love one another as I have loved you. What a word. To, if, if I was leaving this planet, I know I would end up just cross it, just not cross, but I would already be there in the unseen realm with everybody else who has gone on before us and, and, uh, and so on. But if I were no longer going to be able to communicate with human beings the way that I communicate with them now, what a message to leave. Love one another as I have loved you. And that's what Jesus did. Uh, his message, his dying words, in essence, love one another. Uh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what to do. It. <laughs> Today you'll be with me in paradise. I mean, everything from Passover on, not that it wasn't constantly the message of Jesus, but, but if you just look at from Passover to the cross, Everything Jesus said had a love motivation. Absolutely. Well, yeah. he knew that, that that is the the one commandment that if everybody obeyed that one commandment, <laughs> life would be good for everybody. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. because love is the greatest power. So if we learn to love one another and make it genuine and sincere, there's nothing else that is necessary for us to live this life that God has intended for each and every one of us. Yeah. Absolutely. Now think about what would have happened from Passover to today, more than 2,000 years later. We have, we have a 2,000-year segment. So from, from uh, the end of 2,000 years after the cross was 
uh, the 6,000th year, which was the, the reign of man or the, 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 the period of man. And then we have entered into the 7,000th year, which uh, according to biblical uh, theology is the, the rule of God or the reign of God. Uh, Roman uh, Revelation uh, 5 verse 10 says uh, he has made in the Greek says he has made us a kingdom of priests and we reign. Now we reign because we reign with Christ and in Christ. But think about that from the from Passover, when Jesus said, love one another as I love you till now, if we would just heard that one thing, I mean, forget the 400 years of the dark ages. OK, if we just heard, kept that one message flowing our entire uh, society structure would be different today. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Everything would be totally different. And so that's one thing that I'm learning when I, when I preach and I, and I teach messages, I always let it, uh, you know, try to, to make it be out of a motivation of love. I always try to include, include something that talks about God's love. Um, yeah. I might at sometimes I, I might be kind of hard on religion sometimes, but <laughs> that is because I know uh, what it does. It is actually separating yeah. from uh, or or attempting. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Right. But that religion it helps us to 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 separate us. You know the Bible Colossians I believe talks about that we're we're simply set up, uh, separated from God in our mindset, and that's what religion does. It separates us from yeah. the understanding of God. God's love. And so, you know, that, that's one thing that I that I always try to do now and will continue to try to do. Base everything that I say on God's love and try to remind somebody God really does love you unconditionally, despite what, you know, family might say, despite what even uh, people at, at, at church might say. God's love is unconditional. And once we start to receive that, it starts to change our lives inside out. Uh, it's easier to love other people people because we understand if God loves me uh, unconditionally, uh, I, I must at least attempt to try to love other people unconditionally as well. I like the way you put that. We, we at least attempt to do that same thing. Now, uh, just to chime in with you, I also can be tough on religion at times. I never want to, pre and I know you don't do this, but uh, for me, I want to say I never want to present myself as rebelling against religion because uh, the right. way to conquer religion is not by rebellion, but by love. Right. Uh, but we do need to expose religion. Now, right. you know, uh, I, I'm not saying you have a feeling one way or the other. I have a feeling one way or another, but I'm going to give an example. And I'm going to drop a name. Uh, Joel Olstein, uh, who just, you know, basically talks, talks, he's almost like a motivational speaker. He's almost like uh, the cheerleader on the cheer squad. Uh, but regardless of what he preaches, my, my point is this, he has taken a lot of criticism from uh, the church. Uh, I don't care what, honestly, I don't care what he does. He's not affecting me or hurting me one way or the other. I don't watch his programs, but that's not the point. The point is, is that Love doesn't allow me to beat up everybody else while I'm trying to combat religion. Love allows me to love. Yeah. Right. So whether I agree, because I'll, I'll be honest, there are some preachers in our world today, just in the USA, that I really would like to pounce on when it comes to arguing and fussing and fighting about what's right and what's not right. But that's not the act of love. So the act of love you know, the Bible says, let no, uh, no uh, profane words, there's a lot of different expressions there, uh, ever proceed out of our mouths. I'm not talking about profanity, but I'm talking about bashing my brother or my sister. Um, I know what those words mean in the Greek, but that's my point is, is when does love ever allow me to, to uh, verbally beat up somebody else because I don't agree with their theology? <laughs> You know what, Dr. Bill, I kind of laugh at that because, <laughs> you know, you you got people, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, years ago, I would have been in the same boat that want to criticize, uh, you know, Joel Steen for his ministry and uh -huh. what he says. But then I came to the understanding, I started to think about it. Look who he's attracting every single Sunday. He's attracting enough people to fill up a sports arena. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, because his what, church was a sports arena at one time. Exactly. 
But it shows, it really is showing us that people are looking for the message of love. And it's funny to me because it's usually the ones that have about 10 to 12 people in their ministry that are the most critical of what he is saying. But I can't tell understand it. If he's preaching a message that is attracting so many people, you know, yeah. we might not agree with everything he says, but we need to pay attention that he is preaching a message that is drawing that that is drawing people. A message that's not drawing them to fear, but it's drawing them to love. And it, it, it's just my Come opinion. On. We need to pay attention because I just believe that 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 he's a closer representation to what we have seen in the gospel because I believe that the reason that Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus drew multitudes. I ultimately believe that the reason he drew multitudes, it wasn't because he was going to scare anybody into believing. It was because of his love. And so I just believe that yeah. instead of knocking people that are, are preaching and teaching this message of love, we need to join in with them because it's the message that works. Amen. Amen. We all want to reach the masses. Uh, we all want to reach hundreds of thousands of people. But guess what? We're not. <laughs> but there's a guy that is. And, you know, he's not the only one, but he's certainly doing, you know, he's great friends with Joseph Prince and Joseph Prince preaches the gospel of grace. Not all the way I would preach it, but that's really not even the point. Uh, what we can learn is this. I may not be able to agree with everything that someone preaches, but I can agree with something that someone preaches. So I get on the bandwagon of agreement where I can, and then I kind of turn the other cheek where I can't, and I just don't engage that. It would be awesome to be able to comment and engage everything, but, uh, you know, we got more more responsibility on our hands than trying to get involved in every conversation on social media. But the fact is, Thank God for people who are teaching others to love, teaching others to be as Christ. Uh, it's amazing to me, Pastor Lynn, and we'll, we'll uh, let you do a, 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 a bring a, a closing word here in a moment. But it's amazing to me that, that people would choose to be in unforgiveness or in bitterness toward each other instead of walk in love. And I'm talking about all of society. Um, uh, it's amazing to me, the God who is the God of love lives on the inside of us, even when we choose not to walk in that, that same love of our father. Uh, God so loved the world, the whole world. He loved me when I was walking in maybe even an unlovable state, according to some other human being. He loved me when I didn't know anything about how to let him love on me. He loved me when I didn't know how to love anybody else. I mean, that is a loving God. And again, he never leaves us, never forsakes us, never abandons us. Scripture says, I will not. He told his disciples, I will not leave you orphans. Uh, I will not leave you without a parent. Uh, and there's a whole story there. But the point is, this is the kind of God we have. So uh, if you would just speak a word to bring us to a close today. and. Um, uh, yeah, this this has been so good. Well, I would just say this. You know, you had just made the point, and, and I agree wholeheartedly. One thing we got to understand is, you know, if you and I sat down and, and talked about, you know, what we believe about God in, in, uh -huh. in total, there might be some differences, but that's okay. You know, that's one thing. I don't dispute what people might have to say. You know, they, if, if they believe something that, you know, I don't believe if it's not, you know, if our theology doesn't line up totally, that's okay. But one thing that I I am at a place in my life now that regardless of, of, of what, you know, we might believe differently, if someone is preaching love, I am with you 100% because that is the message that I believe that if we found, if, if, if every preaching teacher had a foundation of love, you know, <laughs> no matter if we veer off, you know, and have differences in, in, in some ways, but the message of love is, yeah. is the message that we all should agree ab about. You know, there should never be a time 
that we get, you know, that bewilders me. We we get mad at people that are preaching love. I, I don't understand that when Jesus is love. That was his, his whole message. God is love. You know, yeah. the Father loves you just as he loves me. Wow, what a revelation that is. And so I just will say this, you know, I want to first thank you, Dr. Bill. This has been a blessing. The, the uh, You know, the two times we've been together, I love your heart. I love your ministry. Uh, you know, I just declare great success in all that you're doing. But I just hope that all of us will, will start coming to the place that we, we just uh, come in agreement that if there's anything that we're going to share with anybody, we don't know anything else to say, you know, God loves you. Let's start with that. Let's just start with God's love and let the rest take care of itself. So, you know, let, let's just, you know, let's get away from all of the doctrinal disputes that we've been having and just just be able to declare that we do uh, know that God is love and he loves us just as we are. Amen. 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 So powerful. Now, Pastor Lynn, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um uh, my Tuesday night and Friday morning programs are usually a, a series of three shows. And I just spoke with my director and uh, other people are chiming in. Everybody wants you to come back for that third show. Are you going to be available? Um, it will be um, Friday morning, uh, January the 4th will be the next time I will be on the air uh, on Friday morning. Uh, so... Yeah. Okay. Put me down, okay. Dr. Bill. I got to get my last one. I got to get. <laughs> okay. 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 I was trying to close out the new year. I only had uh, the old year. I only had two shows on Friday, but uh, everybody wants you to come back a third time. And uh, in, in my heart, I really did too. So let me just say this. What you said there as a closing is so powerful. Uh, we probably, you know, I have a lot of people on my Thursday night show that uh, I don't, target it to one uh to one uh i hate to say doctrinal view but one aspect of truth i kind of give people liberty even if they're not on the same page with me but uh but we target these shows to reach people and if we say as you said if we sit down together here's the thing we probably could say okay here's a part of this message of love we agree on but here's a part over here we really don't agree on uh, the, the bottom line is, is that I'd like to say it this way. Not everybody I minister with lives in the same house, but we seem to live in the same neighborhood. And that's really <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the fact is we're preaching love. We're preaching that God loves you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are right now. Father God loves you. But you say, but what about all the details that need to be hashed out in my life? Just understand God loves you and he loves you unconditionally. And those details you're so concerned about, lay them aside and you watch them. They'll start coming together one by one. The way the course of your life, the way you should live it, the way things should go will start coming into the position that they should. We could teach about that. We could talk a whole bunch about it. Some of it would really come out as personal opinion. But the fact is, is God has a plan for you, a personal plan for you. And it's going to come out right. Pastor Lynn, thank you so much for being on the show this morning. And uh, everybody, Pastor Lynn is coming back Friday, uh, January the 4th. Uh, we'll conclude this series for now. Uh, I know that three sessions is not really enough time to do justice to um, all of this. But um, that's kind of the direction we have. So it'll be coming back on January the 4th. And we're wrapping up this, this short series on understanding love. Thank you so much, my brother, for being on the show. Thank you so much, sir. It's been a pleasure. Amen. And happy New Year to everyone that has uh, uh, been viewing. Have a happy New Year. And remember, you know, God is love. And if there's a message that needs to get out to your neighbors, to your co-workers, just a simple message. God loves you. Amen. And we, uh, I just chime in the same from our ministry. Happy New Year. God bless you. And... Um, you know, I remember reading the book that Christ was going to come in 1988. Guess what? He didn't come. And yes. uh, we've heard all of these dates. The fact is he did come a second time. He resurrected from the dead. The only difference is he moved inside of you. So now you have to trust him by faith. And mm -hmm. so praise the Lord. Happy New Year, everyone, uh, along with Pastor Lynn. And uh, have a great our, our Christmas celebration with families actually tomorrow on Saturday. And then. Uh, 
we go into the new year and have a great time. If you go to church Sunday, enjoy it. It may not be the same kind of thing you would do on a new year service. Doesn't really matter. I, I don't do candlelight stuff, but if they do candlelight, we'll participate. Uh, I'm, you know, I have my own version of communion, but if they do communion, then, you know, we'll have fun. Uh, but just enjoy the presence of the Lord, because the presence of the Lord is not coming to you. The presence of the Lord abides in you, and you can draw from that 24-7. God yes. bless you. Happy New Year, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone. Awesome.